Hello and welcome to episode 56, The Agro-Military Crisis of the Late Roman Republic, Part 1. This is from an interview that I did on 104.5 WRFU Urbana, Illinois, on the People's History Hour with Grant Neal and Nick Goodell. I'll leave it at that, and Part 2 of the interview is forthcoming. I discharge my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. We'd like to begin and get into our topic for today. Uh, for today's topic, we will actually be going back to an era that Grant and I do not normally deal with. We'll be going back to ancient Rome. Uh, and for this purpose, we have brought in a guest today, actually, to discuss it with, uh, because we're kind of unfamiliar with the topic, uh, admittedly so. Uh, and our guest today is Thomas Hendrickson. Uh, he is a university student uh, here at UIUC. Uh, he's a senior about to graduate, uh, and he studies classics and history. He's very smart, knows basically everything you'd ever need to know about uh, the classic era, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, all that jazz. Uh, he also has his own podcast uh, available on YouTube. Uh, it has a website, uh, has a Facebook page. It's on iTunes too. It's called Everything History that he does usually pretty much bi-monthly. Uh, Thomas, very good to have you with us today. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I think we're ready to about get started. Um, we're going to be talking today about events that uh, – in ancient Rome, uh, the Roman Republic, that kind of lead up to uh, what's known as kind of the agriculture military crisis that lead into basically all the famous stuff that you guys probably have heard of before of, uh, of Julius Caesar and uh, Augustus uh, and Sola, the dictatorship of Sola and all that. Uh, we're going to be talking about kind of events that lead up to that kind of social and cultural and economic problems that culminate in all those events, those famous events. You might be able to see a few things that could have some modern parallels in some different ways. Indeed. But we'll leave that to your discretion to look for them. So thank you so much for coming on this this week, Thomas. Yes. So would you like me to start by explaining what the agro-military crisis of the late Republic is? Um, Absolutely. Go for it. Right. The agro-military crisis is a problem that Rome had to deal with in its later stages of its republic. So, the Roman Republic began, I'll start there for historical context, it started in 509 BCE, or thereabouts, and lasted until 27 BCE when it morphed into the Principate, which is the uh, early stage of its empire. But by the late 2nd century BCE, which is the time period we'll be talking about today, uh, they, the Romans, had a lot of issues with their military and how they were enlisting soldiers and maintaining the roles. And so they, so the agro-military crisis was the Roman Republic's problem of simultaneously balancing agricultural society with enough farmers, basically, and keeping enough soldiers in its military bodies at the same time. And uh, the history we'll be discussing deals with Rome's attempts to solve the crisis itself as Rome's Republic was expanding. Mm-hmm. And it was expanding quite a lot, too. You outlined a timeline for us. Uh, conquered Sicily in 227 BCE, had the first Punic War from 264 to 241, uh, Sardinia and Corsica, uh, also in the first Punic War, uh, nearer Spain, further Spain in 197. Uh, then they had the second Punic War as well, uh, Africa, parts of Africa, parts of Macedonia, Asia um, and Narbonese Gaul uh, doing a lot of conquering, but a you've, lot of said, expansion. you've said before that conquering actually is not quite the way that you should look at some of these expansions, right? Yes, almost all of those expansions, except the last few of Narbonese Gaul and Asia, which are in about 133, 129 BC for Asia. And Asia to the Romans meant Asia Minor, or what is modern day Turkey to us. And Narbonese Gaul is southern France. Those two things. Uh, those two territories were expansionistic, but the others are what a lot of historians would refer to as acquisitions by defensive aggression, where Rome occupied territories out of a need or desire to no longer fight the people that inhabited such territories. So, in a need to no longer prolong wars or keep getting into conflicts with people like, say, the Macedonians or the Carthaginians, in the uh, Macedonian and Punic Wars, they decided to occupy those territories or destroy those regions entirely in order to no longer fight them. 
but Rome was actually reluctant to take such territories for a long time. In almost every incident, they fought at least three wars. Against the Carthaginians, they fought three separate wars until they finally destroyed Carthage and took their territory. And against the Macedonians, they fought four wars until they finally occupied Greece and made it a province. And they did that, or this, because in the beginning, they, uh, the Romans, had no interest in the territories themselves. They just had an interest in protecting their own, their own territory, personal interest, and an interest in preventing the expansion of uh, people like the Macedonians. And in order to thwart such attempts or the fears of such wars, the Romans fought wars against them. But as they found themselves in more and more of these conflicts and more and more uh, successful and victorious, they had more of a burden, more of an authority. So eventually they had to occupy those nearby territories whether or not they truly wanted to. So it was not necessarily a conscious type of expansion in imperialism. It was more of kind of a reluctant sloping forward, okay, I guess we have to occupy you guys to have some semblance of peace, and then another nation would slowly start to attack them and have scuffles, right? Yeah, you you could also call it reluctant imperialism because you're you're expanding because you feel the need to because if you don't, then people are going to keep fighting and killing you. So in this case, the Roman Republic was expanding out of a keen desire to uh, protect themselves. Yeah. So the the conception that some people have of the entirety of Roman history being a history of conscious imperialist uh, expansion is not – it's kind of an oversimplification, right? It's kind of apish, brutish oversimplification because that doesn't really start until part of the period that we're going to be discussing today. That's the transition we're going to be leading up to. Uh, if you could, could you – Give us a bit of a background, too, about, uh, before we delve into more specific history, about uh, what what the government structure was like uh, under the Republic. Uh, so the different branches and uh, the, the time length requirements, because it's actually quite different, and the nature of what was really kind of, you've called it a true Republic, as opposed to the type of Republic that, say, the United States is today or other Western governments are. Right. So the Roman Republic was definitely a republic, and it worked through a series of legislative assemblies, which are similar to our American and modern Western assemblies. But the Roman system worked with the Senate at the top of the legislative pecking order. The Senate was was made up of a select number of people. These people were of the upper class, the senatorial class, who themselves were the upper crust of the upper class people called the patricians. Below them were the plebeians and non-citizens, such as slaves, for the non-citizens. And so, in the Republican government of Rome, they had the Senate, made up of the elite of the elite. And occasionally, yes, plebeians would join the ranks of the Senate as well, but below the Senate, there were a series of popular assemblies, such as the Curiae Assembly, the Centuriate Assembly, and the Council of the Plebs. But the primary function of Republican government was through the Senate. Mm. Um. Can you explain, too, real quick, the, the tribunal system and also uh, kind of give us a hint to, as to some of these class systems that you've discussed? So the tribunal system, when we hear that phrase, our mind might jump on to thoughts of the judicial system, and they are closely related. But in this case, Rome had a system of officials known as tribunes. They were tribunes of the plebs or plebes, and their numbers varied, but their number was was generally set at 10, and these tribunes were official representatives on behalf of plebeians, the vast majority of the citizenry, and they had the authority that when uh, the Senate decided to pass a law or propose some sort of measure, a tribune could rise to oppose the measure by simply saying veto, or veto, more correctly, which means I forbid, and that would stop the legislation and the Senate would have to start over and get prior approval from another popular assembly, namely, um, the Council of the Plebs. So the tribunes are very important officials politically for the power they wielded, and they also often served as the bridge between the patricians and the plebeian classes. And by the end of the second century BCE, and by the end of the second century uh, BCE, the tribunes were very important political officials. And above the tribunes, there were many other magisterial positions, most of which I don't have to go through, but magisterial uh, refers to executive, so executive positions, and these magistrates, well, the official that we need to introduce now are the consuls, or the officials, I should say. The consuls were the executives of the state. They had uh, military authority called imperium, which means military command, sort of. It's really not a translatable term. And so there were two consuls at the same time, 
and their terms lasted for only a year. And generally throughout most of the Republic, individuals served only once in their life as a consul. Tradition dictated such a practice. Being a consul is a great, great honor, but you definitely do not overindulge yourself with the honor, and it was very much against traditional practice to run for re-election. Furthermore, um, a Roman was not to serve continually in any of the magisterial positions, actually, for to do such a thing uh, was impolitic and against the Constitution and borderline sacrilegious to do so. Mm -hmm. And you say constitution. The Romans did not have like a constitution in the way that we think of the modern Western idea of what yeah. a constitution is. Right. So, yes, we discussed this before and we'll discuss it now. The Roman constitution is much more ethereal than ours, yet very much important. So in modern Western societies, a constitution is often literally a written document or set of documents that um, dictate the way the government is supposed to function and the way that people are supposed to behave in, in regards to the government and law. Sort of like a written set of boundaries. And the same thing existed in Rome, for that's where we get the word and the concept, that is from, we get constitution from Roman society. But Rome's constitution was not written, rather it was a series of traditions that were attached to their system of religion, of polytheism that is, and attached to other facets of their society. It was very ingrained in their culture. But it wasn't written down. They wrote down their laws, of course, but it was much more than just laws or boundaries of governance. Was it just a general public understanding of something? Yeah, it was an understanding of how things worked, and there are many different avenues regarding how, and there were, and there were many different avenues regarding how this constitution manifested itself. But it'll be very important to keep in mind when we start discussing the agro-military crisis of the late republic because people began to openly violate this Roman constitution. And, and, as we will see, when the constitution was violated, there were often very real, often violent consequences. So, though it's not written down, it is very much understood. Mm. Um, so, with these wars, then, that I discussed, uh, this reluctant imperialism, um, the people that were fighting these wars, then, were often, uh, they weren't, you know, the senators or the senatorial classes, right? They were usually lower class people. Well, actually, in the beginning, or rather in the archaic days, it was always the upper crust of society that fought, which is something that we find a little bit hard to understand because it is often poor people that are compelled to fight in the modern age. But in Greco-Roman society, especially early Greco-Roman societies where there were small, concentrated city-states, it was the rich and wealthy citizens that fought because it was was a great honor to fight. And you brought your own weapons, your own armor and materials to war in order to fight. And you had to be a property-owning male citizen. And it was very much ingrained in the culture to fight on behalf of the state, on behalf of the city. But that concept, which stemmed from the Homeric Age, became rather unsustainable, or it just becomes unsustainable in general when the state, in this case Rome, becomes too big. When it's no longer a city-state fighting another city-state, but it's a city that controls great swaths of territory fighting in distant lands. And their select group of property-owning citizens can't or couldn't fight on behalf of that entire um, territory. And so the system had to slowly change as it went along because it couldn't sustain itself. Uh, can you speak to um, <clears throat> excuse me, the development of the, agricult the agricultural part of the crisis to... Uh, for a long time in Rome, there was a law, I believe passed sometime in like the 360s or 370s BCE, that said you could only have farms of a certain size. It limited the size of farmlands that one person or one family could own. Um, but people began to violate that. Why was that? And how did that lead to the crisis we're about to talk about? Right, yeah. The limit on farmland was 500 yugata. A yugata was about two-thirds of an acre. So that's about 333 acres. Yes, I believe that's accurate. Now, that was the limit that a person could actually own. And the reason for that limit was because as a Roman soldier, or rather to be a Roman soldier, you not only had to be a male citizen, you had to be a property owner. So they wanted to limit how much wealthy individuals could own because wealthy people had the ability to buy most of the land, and that would disturb the entire system, the military system that is. Not so much the economic system, actually, but yes, without that limit, they would not have been able to maintain the enlistment roles. And and so people nevertheless began to skirt around this rule because they began to rent out money, resources, or materials to poorer individuals so wealthy patricians would, yes, 
only have technically owned, in many cases, 333 acres. But in reality, because so many other people were obliged to their service in one way or another, such individuals, wealthy individuals, technically wielded far more land. So in a very real sense, wealthy individuals were still able to profit off of and manage far more land than the law originally dictated. And these large estates held by wealthy senators were often referred to as latifundiae. Hmm. Um, and so then with basically what's becoming like an expansion of credit, right, a lot of these uh, lower level people are getting indebted then to this ruling class, uh, right? And then uh, with that comes kind of, I would assume, is kind of a uh, animosity of the lower classes towards the upper classes. Uh, and then that kind of manifests itself, right, in this appearance of the Gracchi brothers. Is that correct? Right. And the Gracchi are two brothers, Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus. Tiberius was active in 133 BCE and, of course, before that, and Gaius came to prominence a decade later in 123-122 BCE. And they both suffered an untimely end, but both uh, tried to solve the agricultural military crisis in their own ways. Both tried to expand um, the property basin through aggressive legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's interesting, too, to talk about these uh, the Gracchi brothers. Uh, I'm pronouncing that correctly, right? The yes. Gracchi brothers. Okay. Uh, it's spelled, like, to the layman, it's spelled like Gracchi, so <laughs> <laughs> like Gracchus or something. Uh, but so the Gracchi brothers, too, they had an interesting upbringing with their mother. She was actually the daughter of Scipio Africanus, right? So the Gracchi brothers were actually the grandsons of Scipio Africanus, who's one of the most famous generals, basically, of all time. Yes, yes. So they were a very blue-blooded family, a very important patrician family. So yes, their ancestors held great esteem because Scipio Africanus was forever famous for having defeated the great Roman enemy Hannibal of Carthage, especially notable for his victory at the Battle of Zama, and also known for his successful encounters in Asia during the Syrian War. They were also, of course, related to the nearly as great Scipio Aemilianus, who was extremely successful in Greece. So the Gracchi brothers were of a very important family. This isn't a lower class family gaining great esteem that we're talking about. These are brothers with a great name gaining popularity um, among the masses. Yeah, and there's an interesting story, too, of the mother of uh, the Gracchi brothers saying uh, she was asked once, as this very wealthy Roman woman, why she did not display her jewels in public as many other Roman women did. And uh, she just pointed to her sons and said, those are my jewels. They're on display all the time. Yes. So that is an example of a proper Roman matrona. That is a proper wife, a proper woman. What she did was what you were meant to do as a Roman woman if your husband died, as her husband had. You, as a good Roman woman and widow, you were not supposed to remarry. You were to stay with your family, take care of your children, and fulfill that role. And she did that, and she did exactly that. And she was greatly praised for it, and her sons were ideals of Roman men for a long time as well. But I think it's good to bring this up, as you have, because despite their blue-blooded and respected nature as good Roman citizens, the Gracchi brothers would not be spared um, for their violations of Roman tradition. Uh, and with this legislation, too, so they basically... Tiberius, the older of the Gracchi brothers, uh, comes to power as uh, a tribunal uh, in 133 BCE, yes. Uh, and he proposes basically some very progressive legislation, but it'd be interesting to see, uh, I'm not sure if we have this information with us today, but their, how did they get their progressive background? Because their mother must have been very inspirational to them in some ways. I'm sure that wasn't a very common... In many common... ways, they seem to have been kind of divergent from their own class's interests in yes. a lot of ways. Okay, so how did they get their progressive nature? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, so that's a difficult question because we do not and cannot know their upbringing. But I would say that they were doing what they thought was best for the state. So to go out on a limb, perhaps they weren't doing what they did on behalf of the people. They were doing it on behalf of the state. And they met with resistance because what they proposed was change substantial change, and Romans were a conservative, very conservative people, never liked change. So the Gracchi brothers are considered progressives by us, and rightly so, but their progressiveness was because they thought their actions would have worked, and they likely would have, but as we will soon see, 
their actions compromised Roman tradition and were not back and were not backed up by upper class support or any means of financial support support or any significant means of financial support. So it's almost more of a pragmatism rather than exactly. a type out of, of efficiency yeah. rather than like some moral ideas about helping the underclasses of Rome. Yes, right. So as we're going to see, the Gracchi brothers are going to break the rules, as in the Constitution, at several points, but they will never actually break the law. But they nevertheless break traditional practice, and that brings the powers that be against them and their supporters. So... When Tiberius then in 133 BCE is elected to one of these plebeian tribunals, right? Tribune of the plebs, that is. Tribune of the plebs. Uh, he proposes uh, legislation that would basically institute land reform and basically say, uh, if you own land that's over the 500, uh, it's pronounced Ugara, right? Yeah. Uh, limits, uh, then we can basically seize this land from you and redistribute it to people who have lesser land. Yes, that's what the reforms do. Yes, but before we get too deep into the reforms, I think it's right to apply a little bit more context, because the event we're talking about, the legislation that is coming in 133 BCE and the year shortly after, was initiated by Tiberius Gracchus, so that's in 133 BCE, and also very importantly in that same year, the kingdom of Pergamon, which was a very important Hellenistic kingdom, and... Attalus III, the leader of Pergamon, upon his death bequeathed his entire kingdom, that is, of Pergamon, to Rome. So the Roman Senate had to decide whether or not they were going to accept that strange offer. And Pergamon was extremely wealthy in their Ionian territory, um, was prime Mediterranean land, and they still held the bulk of the legacy and uh, the wealth left over from Alexander the Great's conquests. And the Roman Senate after a great deal of heated debate, indeed decided to assimilate Pergamon into their republic. This was a key decision because the Senate had decided, perhaps unbeknownst to themselves, to officially become imperialistic. They were now officially acknowledging their power and their role as essentially a republican empire. And that decision needs to be understood in the story of the Gracchi brothers, especially as it comes on the eve of Tiberius Gracchus's propositions yeah seems to be where roman um roman imperialism seems to begin to converge a bit with the more modern definition of what imperialism is absolutely so what this that means is despite the decision being hotly contested for the decision to accept pergamon uh, barely passed but what that means to us looking back is that there was a clear ideological shift in Rome. That acceptance of Pergamon was Rome's realization that they were the leaders of the Mediterranean and that they now had a responsibility over those wide territorial domains and its various peoples, whether or not they liked it or not. And Pergamon is in modern day uh, Western Turkey, yes? Yes, in what was known as Ionia. Okay, so Tiberius, then, with this legislation that he proposes, he actually uses some kind of fiery rhetoric and it's recorded by Plutarch uh, and others, uh, and he says, Quote, the wild beasts of Italy have their holes and dens to retire to, but the brave men who spill their blood in her cause have nothing left when they come back from the wars but light and air. They fight and die merely to increase the wealth and luxury of the rich. They are called the masters of the world, while none of them has a foot of ground of his own. Uh, so that's very fiery rhetoric to be using, and he, he gets a lot of mass support for these types of land reforms, right, because all these people have been going off essentially to fight and die, uh, in these wars, these successive wars, uh, now it looks, too, as if uh, Rome is about to start to maybe take a more imperialistic approach. So not only they might have basically more wars is what this the gift of Pergamon means, basically, uh, the acceptance of Pergamon. Uh, so the people uh, have been having a rough experience of going to fight in war, some of them, and then when they come back, they discover that their families, uh, as happens, you said, in the uh, HBO uh, Rome show, right, uh, uh, people come back and they find out, oh, uh, my family has basically taken a lot of credit from this rich, wealthy landlord, and basically now we're almost in a way like uh, credit slaves to these people indebted to them so heavily. They formed a much more powerful ruling class. So this kind of populist rhetoric is actually becoming quite popular, and it gets him a lot of plebeian support, yes? Uh-huh. So in that statement, Tiberius Gracchus was directly appealing to the masses, and he knew what he was doing, too. He was aware of the sufferings of the lower classes, and he sought to gain their support in order to try and stop or assuage the agro-military crisis. Mm -hmm. And popular support can pass a legislation, right? That's how the government system yeah. works. 
That is right, and this is an interesting thing to note. The Council of Plebs could dictate plebiscites and other forms of legislation that would be enacted as law, but there was a caveat to such abilities, and this has to do with the Roman Constitution and their emphasis on tradition. For, yes, the Council of Plebs could pass laws, but tradition demanded that such decisions were to be approved of by the Senate ahead of time. And that's something that Tiberius Gracchus actually did when he first proposed his legislation, or tried to do, and we should explain that legislation soon. Um, he proposed it to the Senate according to tradition, but they denied him. But instead of revising his proposal or giving up, Tiberius took it directly to the Council of Plebs, where his legislation was passed straight away. And this was a breach of the Roman Constitution because he should have gotten the absolute approval of the Roman Senate before passing his proposal but he skirted Roman tradition instead. So he just went directly to the people and then didn't go back to the ruling class of the people, basically. Right, and with the people, these are a select <clears throat> uh, number of plebeians. And plebeians were not necessarily poor people or landless folk. They are Roman citizens, or rather they were Roman citizens, and the best of them were of the Council of Plebs and had the ability to weigh, consider, and pass legislation upon the condition that they seek the guidance and approval of the Senate but they skirted the traditional guidance of the Senate. So can we talk for a bit about what exactly these right. specific reforms proposed and these populist reforms? So what Tiberius Gracchus proposed to do in 133 BCE was take the Agia Publica, the, the public land, and dispense it out to landless plebeians or other landless people of partial citizenship. And as an addendum to his proposal, Tiberius tried to give a bone to the senators and the patricians in general by stating that if there were patricianary elite folk who did not already have 333 acres, then he would give such men that much territory, and also give their eldest son 166 acres, so half the amount, I believe. But as a condition for the concession to the senators, the remainder of the designated land would be given out to the landless, or those good citizens with small property holdings. And so that was Tiberius Gracchus's plan to address the crisis giving land especially to, like, homeless veterans, too, and then also to just homeless people in general would make them citizens, taxable citizens, too. So it would be, in a way, just creating more citizens of the republic, right? Not necessarily, actually. This this really has nothing to do with non-citizens, so it's not necessarily great legislation on behalf of non-citizen people, um, although it is partially beneficial to them in the long run. But such non-citizens did not have a say in Roman politics. But partial citizens, such as the Italian allies, as we'll get into with Gaius Gracchus, they do have some small say in politics. But Tiberius and his supporters really just wanted to expand the property base. See, this is why we have you on the show, to correct me when I say stupid things like that. <laughs> uh, really yeah. Really yeah. However... Relatively mild and limited, these reforms of uh, Gracchus are. They still do represent um, big shakeups in the way that property management is done in Rome, right? Absolutely. By giving out land in such a manner, one that we might deem socialist, uh, it's directly taking land from some people, and the Latifundii holders, who were likely to lose land, or influence at least, did not want anything taken from them. So, yeah, the reforms were destined to shake up the property-holding system, as you say. So he knows he's going to meet opposition with this basically very populist, unorthodox bill, right? So he just takes it directly to the people, like well, we said. Well, yes, but Tiberius first proposed it to the Senate with addendums and all, but because they rejected his proposal, he went straight to the Council of Plebs and got it passed there. And a fellow tribune was going to oppose him, and he knew this, but he just basically deposes them. Right, yeah, yeah. the uh, class oust him out of office. <laughs> Which is kind of funny to think about, just a, a mass of people just basically coming to his office, right, and right, well, kicking him out. Well, a mass of people basically voting against this person as a representative of those. Oh, okay, so not so direct, yeah. But when he takes uh, his reforms directly to the Council of the Plebes, uh, this is very unorthodox and goes against the Constitution or the traditions. Correct. Uh, so... Then the Senate becomes really pissed off at him, right? Absolutely. Not only is he proposing these radical reforms, but he's doing so outside of the traditions or the constitutionality of uh, how things are typically done in the Roman Republic. Uh, so it was lawfully correct, but basically not constitutionally correct, which is kind of a yes. uh, oxymoron in today's society, but back then that was something that would make right, sense. So breaking tradition of what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to go on a regular path and pass legislation in a certain way, pass laws in a certain way, 
And everyone knew you could do it the other way, but to do that was sacrilegious. And so, because Roman laws and Roman tradition are very much attached to their system of religion, their idea of the sanctity of the gods, and they connected their legates, their, their laws very much to um, the gods themselves. And so to break that tradition was considered breaking with the um, um, sacrosanctity of the city itself. Mm -hmm. So Tiberius then takes it to the people. Um, he also proposes that it used the money from the gift of Pergamon too, but that kind of uh, gets right. shut down, right? So what, he, has, so what he, he still has to fund this bill. He gets it mm -hmm. passed through law. But just like in the U.S. where the House of Representatives controls the pocketbook, so if a law is passed or any form of legislation, it still needs funding because otherwise it would be ineffective. And the Senate controls such funding. And so that's another way that legislation could be killed in Rome as well, simply refusing to finance it. So back to Tiberius Gracchus, he needed the Senate to finance his past legislation in order that it could go into effect and actually accomplish something. But naturally, the Senate refused because they didn't approve of anything Tiberius was doing. So Tiberius proposed, or threatened actually, to use the newly acquired money from the acceptance of Pergamon, which was a massive amount, to finance his land reform legislation. And so with that threat, the Senate backed down and agreed to finance his legislation. But, but Tiberius again had violated tradition by manipulating the system so openly to get what he desired, or rather, what he needed. And threatening the Senate isn't going to get you too far in the Roman Republic. Mm. But because of the tribunal system, uh, Tiberius actually has an election coming up, right? Yes, so he wanted to make sure that the law was not only passed, but also put into effect as he intended it. So Tiberius didn't want his land reform legislation to lie stagnant after he left office, so what he decided to do was run, unprecedentedly, for another term as tribune of the plebs for the year 132 BCE. Now, a Roman could be a tribune several times in a lifetime, although that was rare, but to hold the office consecutively was very much impolitik, and yet another breach of Roman tradition. It was considered far too reminiscent of the time of Roman kings to hold any office for longer than a year at a time, and so when the Senate and the patrician class in general heard of this, then that was the last straw. The Senate had had enough, and they turned against Tiberius Gracchus. Mm. He was shaking up the uh, Roman constitutional system a bit too much. Yes. Yeah. Totally crossing the line because from the perspective of the senators, not only did Tiberius have his legislation passed without our approval, he extorted us to fund his own reforms. And now he expects us to sit idly by as he runs for an unconstitutional re-election? Not to keep dealing with you? So yeah, they thought that was totally over the line. And so they thought it was so much over the line then that on election day, uh, they gathered the, the patrician class and his senatorial opposition uh gather a bunch of supporters, and they use pieces of old furniture, and they start a mob to go track Tiberius down and kill him, basically. Right, so the Roman Senate decided as a group that to preserve the state, their republic, they needed to beat Tiberius to death in the street. So they proceeded to grab pieces of furniture from the Senate house, the street, the market, wherever, in order to kill Tiberius Gracchus and his supporters. Yeah, and by most accounts, 300 supporters, too. So this is kind of unprecedented type of bloodshed in Roman political history, right. too. That's right. The Roman Republic started with bloodshed. That was with the rape of innocent Lucretia and the subsequent murder of King Tarquin Superbus and his son, the final king of Rome. And soon after, the Republic was founded by those who eliminated the royals, chiefly Marcus Junius Brutus the Elder in 509 BCE. But, but after that moment, the Romans of the Republic intentionally strayed away from violence and politics, especially violence among the patricians and senators themselves, which was exactly what was happening here with the Gracchi brothers. The reason for the lack of political violence for so long amongst the upper class was to maintain cohesion because when the elites remained united, they maintained control over society. And so in an attempt to reestablish cohesion, the senators in 132 BCE decided to personally eliminate the problem that was Tiberius Gracchus. And that concludes part one of this interview. Remember that you can contact me on the podcast Facebook page or at the email address everythinghistorypodcast at gmail.com. Thank you very much.